Hi, so this is a long and talky video. It's about 25, 30 minutes long. And I do understand not everybody wants to sit and watch me talk for half an hour. So I split it up and I've put um, blue titles on everything so you can skip about as you want. And if you want a quick summary of the video, just go to the in summary title and that's at the end. And um, you can watch that and see what you think. And if you want to watch the rest of it, please feel free. If you want to skip the lot, go for it. Anyway, if you don't and you want to um, watch the video, it's about how to be an inventor, how to go about solving problems and what kind of things you need to look at if you're going to be an inventor or if you're going to come up with solutions to problems. Anyway, hope you enjoy it and thank you for watching. Hi, so there are two reasons I make a video. The first one is I've done something and I want to show you because I think it'll be helpful and I do videos that are practical in nature. And the second one is I get asked the same question time and time again. Uh, and I figure that um, if I make a video that answers that question, then I'm going to save an awful lot of time because all I have to do is copy and post, please see video. And, and this is a talking head video. So if you're expecting a, a demonstration of something, then please feel free to turn off. It isn't. I'm going to be answering a question that, particularly tonight actually, I answered about 12 emails with this basically this same question, has come to mind. And um, it really is about how do you go around solving a problem? Or another way, how do you go around inventing something? Now, I don't have any real answers. All I have is a way that I do something, and if that's helpful to you, then that's great to know, and, and I really do hope that it helps you. So essentially, there are two ways of solving any problem. There's a theoretical approach and there's a practical approach. Now, it's obvious which one I favor, I'm a practical guy. So to me, the theoretical approach, which is pretty much grabbing yourself a glass of wine, finding a hot bath or a sunny spot, nodding off and dreaming up wonderful scenarios is not really an approach I have much sympathy with. Whereas picking up um, a real world problem, finding something that you ask yourself, hey, can I do that better, is something I have much more sympathy with. And if you read those books, uh, and I did years ago, on how to be an inventor, which is kind of one of my ambitions as a kid, then they all say exactly the same thing. What you need to do is look at the world, find yourself a problem, find yourself something where you ask yourself, how can I do that better? And then find a way of doing it better. That's how you become an inventor. And that is very much the nub of my approach to things. When looking at stuff, I ask myself, how can this practically be done? Academia doesn't agree with that. Academia loves theory. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that particularly. Um, Apart from the fact that it doesn't do anything, it's an endless repetition. It's a cycle of uh, what-if questions and then purely notional answers that raise more what-if questions. And that's great if what you're doing is pursuing a grant for the next 50 years. Knock yourself out. If what you're producing are research papers, brilliant. No problem at all. Go and ask those questions. But if what you want to do is something real, that is, make something that will change the world, make something that will add the world to the world, solve a problem, theory isn't that much help. Now, that's not to say that theory isn't any help. Of course theories help. Of course it helps you direct. And to me, that's what theory is all about. Theory should be a summation of practice a guideline for helping you improve what you actually do. It shouldn't be a rule, a law, a governing statement that harnesses what you do and directs you only down one channel. And unfortunately, that's the way it's become. Nowadays, when somebody spouts theory, they spout it like it's a law that can't be denied. And yet, that's absolute nonsense. It's really just a guesstimate about what we think is happening. So if you want to do something, you want to make something, you want to invent something, you want to solve a problem, dreaming up scenarios which raise nothing more than what-if questions is not going to be much help. What you really need to do is 
Be specific about your problem. What problem is it you want to solve? So I did a video on um, how to make graphene sheets as large as you like. And in a um, practical sense, it's actually a reasonable approach to it if you want to make something like capacitors because it's a um, particular problem with a particular solution that has a way of going around and doing it in your kitchen and, and, and that's what it's all about. But somebody wrote to me and said that this isn't graphene. What you need if you want graphene is you need an infinitely piece of aluminium and it's got to be perfectly smooth and it has to have a one atom layer thick in a hexagonal structure across the whole surface and you have graphene. Well, in theory, of course, that's true. So what is it I actually made? Well, it was a few layer thick graphene oxide sheet that me needed reducing back to um, graphene to make your supercapacitors or your water filters. And it's a practical solution. To get an infinitely long piece of aluminium that is perfectly smooth is an impossible task. It's never going to happen. So there's no point in even trying to approach it with that kind of thought in mind. If you have that kind of thought in mind, one thing you're going to guarantee is you're not going to do it. Sometimes I wonder if that's the whole point of questions like that. But you're never going to approach the problem from that kind of standpoint. The um, idea of making graphene sheets as big as you like was all about a specific problem. That is, how do you make large area surfaces for things like supercapacitors, or membrane filters for water purification or ethanol purification. And that specific problem led to that specific answer. Now, that material's no good for um, lots of other things. It would make an absolutely rubbish um, transparent display, for instance. It'd be terrible. Because you need a different approach with a different problem. But it was problem specific. So I begin by looking at what problem is it that I want to solve? The next step, a step I take is to ask myself, what available techniques and methodologies do I have out there that I can apply to this problem? What can I bring there to do it? What kind of things are available to me? Can I make those things better? And then produce a specific solution in relation to the specific problem that I've looked at. Now, I call that a problem looking for a solution. And that's my approach to it. When I look at coming up with something. When I look at um, solving issues, I look at it with that way around. Problem, solution. Now theoreticians look at it the other way around. They look at solution, problem. So what they do is, as I say, they have a little daydream about it. They come up with something that they think is wonderful, some idea that they've got, and they think, you know, that's a really good idea. Now how can I use that idea to solve real world problems? So don't get me wrong, this is not semantics. This is a very big difference in the way that you approach things. On the one hand, what I'm suggesting is that the best way of approaching so something is to be problem-oriented. That is, have your problem, and then look at ways of finding your solution. Rather than the other way, where you dreamed up a wonderful scenario, and you try and find a problem for it to fit. That way, to my mind, is doomed to failure. So it's a very important issue to take on board. The, to me, best way of approaching this is the problem-solution approach. So in looking at this problem-solving approach, what you're doing is going through a three-stage process. The first stage is defining your problem. The second stage is doing the research. And the third stage is implementing it. So when looking at the problem-solution approach, something becomes really, really important, and that is, what is your problem? If you don't understand the problem, you'll never find a solution. You have to be specific about your problem. What is it you're looking to try to solve? So, a lot of people write to me and say, do you have a wonderful way for doing X, Y, and Z? And what they're looking for is, something that will solve a problem, but they haven't told me what the problem is. So I really can't help. And I'll make some suggestion, they'll get, come back and go, oh yeah, but that won't work because, and I'll make another suggestion, they'll come back and say, that won't work because, and then I stop making suggestions. Because I don't know what the problem is. When you know what the problem is, then solutions start to appear actually almost by themselves, because 
Finding a solution really isn't about finding the solution. I know that seems an odd thing to say, but it isn't. Finding a solution is actually about defining your problem. What is your problem? Now, a lot of people don't really define the problem properly. So they'll say something like, oh, I want to create a um, high-powered thrust. And I go, oh, okay, well, why don't you try exploding this? And they go, oh, because that's dangerous and it'll create a lot of toxic gas. So what they have is not really defined the problem. What they want to do is create a high-powered th uh, thrust that doesn't pollute. That's a different problem, because creating a high-powered high, th high -powered thrust actually is relatively simple. There's a, a hundred ways to do it. You can do it chemically, you can do it electrostatically, there's loads of ways of doing it. Um, do it magnetically, you can do it with an EM field, loads of ways of creating a high-powered thrust. But that's not what the problem is. Their problem is something else, and they haven't shared what that problem is, so the answer doesn't really pee, uh, appeal to them or appease them because it's not an answer to the problem that they've got. Now, half the time the reason people write to me and say this is not because that they're being deliberately obtuse, it's because they don't really understand the problem themselves. They haven't defined the problem properly in their own heads. So let's talk a little bit about defining the problem. In order to do that, we'll look at this um, echo foam thing that I came up with. Uh, you can have a look at the other videos on the echo foam if you want more information about it. But what's the problem here? Okay, the problem is a good way of getting your hands clean. Now that's a very, very generic way of talking about that problem and not really very helpful because of course there are hundreds of good ways of getting your hands clean. But as we define that problem, as we break that problem down into the components of what it is that I actually wanted to get at, then we see that there's a whole list of things there. So, for example, one of the things about current methodologies is that um, it uses a lot of chemicals. So, I wanted to reduce the number of chemicals. It uses a lot of water, so I wanted to take that out. It uses a lot of energy, so I wanted to take that out. It wastes a lot of plastic, so I wanted to take that out. And so, defining the problem of how to create a system that was efficient at washing your hands led to all those other aspects of that problem once you get those other aspects of that problem sorted out, you start to get a clear idea of what solution you're going to have. When I'm talking about defining a problem, I'm talking about going through a process. What is it exactly that you want this thing to do? So when defining a problem, what you need to do is think through the ramifications of the problem. What is it exactly that you're looking for? Not something vague and woolly, like, oh, I want a nice cup, or I want an Easter egg in the shape of a hedgehog. Those kind of things get you started, but they won't help you finish. In order to get to the finish line, what you have to do is work through the problem. What exactly is it? How big does it need to be? What colour does it need to be? What shape does it need to be? What are the properties does it need to have? Where does it need to sit? Who's going to use it? How's it going to interact with everything else? What's it going to be made of? How big is it going to be? All those simple and complicated questions help define your problem. Once you've defined the problem properly, then nine times out of ten, a way of doing it is going to be pretty obvious and pretty much straightforward in front of you and there's going to be a lot of choices on how to do it. Now, when you make those decisions, they'll begin to direct you. So let's look at our thrust example again. If you're wanting to do something that will thrust something into the air, why are you wanting to do that? Are you wanting to make a projectiles for military use? Are you wanting to make a toy? Are you wanting to make a way of chucking a small mouse across a room so the cat will chase it? Why is it that you want to fire this projectile? What do you want the thrust for? So you need to look at all of these things when thinking about defining your problem. Perhaps the most important question is, certainly from my perspective, is why do you want to do it? When you answer the question why, very often it gives you direction. When you've answered the question why, and then defined it thoroughly, you're ready to move on to the next step. So once you've defined the problem, it's actually a starting point. Now, don't get too tied up that this three-stage process is a do one step, finish, do the next step, finish, do the third step, done. Each step informs the other step. 
So once you've defined your problem much more clearly, you're onto the step of doing the research. Now, doing the research is pretty tedious, and it's one of those steps that, because it's so tedious, people skip. We're just people. We like to have easy ways of doing things. But if you're wanting to solve problems and invent something, then you can't skip this step. You have to do it, and it's really boring. What it consists of is going to the library or going to the internet and looking what other ways have people used to try and solve these problems. So let's look at soap. One of the biggest solutions to soap is to boil up some animal fat with some lye and you get soap. It's a solution. It's not a very good solution for our modern world, but still a solution. And there's plenty of places where it would still be a good solution. Okay, That's part of the problem definition. If part of your soap problem definition was creating a soap in the middle of nowhere up on a mountain from nothing more than bare fat and, ha and wood ash, that's a great way of doing it. But we don't want that, we want a different solution because we have a different problem. So we need to have a look at what other people have been doing, what other ways exist. So you sit on your computer and you type in Google, soap, methods of manufacture. They'll come up with a hundreds and hundreds of sites telling you all about how other people have been doing it. What is it that you basically need to do? And you need to read it all. You need to read it all, you need to go through it, you need to digest it, you need to find out why each thing is included in that soap, why each element has been added and what it's for. Then when you've done that, you can start asking yourself, okay, now how can I make that better? So when I was looking at this and I was looking at hand washers, then one of the biggest contributions to hand washers is water. And most hand wash is about 90% water. So let's get rid of the water. What are you left with? Well, you're left with quite a few liquid concentrated ingredients that mostly are quite nasty. So what we need to do is break down the function of each of those ingredients and look for alternative ingredients that are green, economically friendly, non-caustic and still do the job and that process of breaking things down looking at why they're there selecting alternatives putting them back in together to see what happens is an inventive step now i did that with the soap i do that with the inks i do that with graphene processors i do that with uh, free energy devices all kinds of things are adaptable to this approach so step one define your problem Step two, do your research and use that research to inform your problem definition and that'll lead you on to step three. Step three is all about the implementation of it. Now, once you've done your research, made your decisions, don't, uh, had a guess at what you think is going to be an improvement and given it a go, you need to put all this stuff together and try and see if it works. And this is experimentation. When you're experimenting with something, you give it a go, take some results, have a look at them, see if it's got the result you want, make some changes, do it all again. And again, it's a fairly tedious process. You have to do it, fail, do it, fail, do it, fail. And you have to go through all of those steps until you get some measure of success. And it's going to happen over a long period of time and take you a lot of effort. There is no easy way to do it. If you don't want to do these things, that's not a problem. Just don't expect to create something. A creative act is an act of anguish. You're gonna have to suffer. You're gonna have to fail. And you're gonna have to get over failing. If you do something once and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means that you've done something slightly wrong. And you need to change what you've done. But you can't just change everything or you'll make no headway. You need to change in an uh, organised and methodological manner. So make notes. What is it you did? What was the temperature like? What was the day like? What constitute, um, constituents did you use? And change one of those things and see what happens. If it gets worse, change it back and change something else. See what happens. And that's the whole role of experimentation. That's what implementation is all about. So you define your problem. You've done your research. You've re redefined your problem on the basis of your research. Now you're experimenting to implementation. And this whole process takes a very long time. 
Now, we get used to things on YouTube that it's all done in sort of like five or ten minutes. Anything that gets an hour just doesn't get watched. People want instant now. It just doesn't work that way. If you think it's going to work that way, you're fooling yourself. It's going to take work. And it's going to take months, sometimes years, to get good results. I know people have been working on things for 30 years and they're still just beginning to get results. And you have to admire that. I know people who stumble across something in five minutes. That's just good luck. It's not going to happen to you. Some people do win the lottery. Some people do stumble over things. Some people do have inventive steps where it just comes to them in the bath. But for the rest of us, that's 99.99999% of all the rest of mortality. It isn't going to happen. You're going to have to work at it. And if you don't want to work at it, don't do it. So when implementing something, do your experiments, make your notes, make your changes, and eventually through that process, you'll actually find yourself with good solutions coming out. You'll find yourself with things that you can actually use, things you can actually make, and things that if you want to, you can actually sell. And that's how you approach these things, I think. Okay, so I consider summaries to be for those people who don't want to watch the whole thing. And I've got some sympathy with that. It is, after all, 20 or 30 minutes long. That can be a bit boring. So, in summary, it's all about how to go around solving problems, how to be an inventor. And it's a three-stage process. That is, define your problem, do your research, implement your solution. Now, don't get tied up with the fact that it's a one, two, three, and finish. It's an iterative process. Each step informs the other step and it's under constant review. But that's basically it. If you go through those three steps, then according to me, that's the way that you're going to be able to solve your problems most easily. It's certainly the approach that I use and it's certainly the one that I've found to be most productive for me. But don't get um, tied up with the idea that it's going to have instant results. It isn't. And I'm... Um, a couple of quotes are brought to mind. The first one is by um, Edison. He said that invention is, uh, I think, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. You're going to have to work. And the other one is Ford when asked um, if his son was lucky. And he said, yes, then the harder he works, the luckier he gets. It's all about doing the work. You're not going to have the solutions presented to you. It's just not going to happen. Now, obviously, I get a lot of email correspondence. I talk a lot to people. It doesn't take me very long to work out if you've done the research or not. If you've done the research, I'm quite likely to talk to you. If you haven't done the research, I'm quite likely to tell you to do the research. If you don't want to do the research, I'm quite likely to blow you off with a pat answer or two. I'm really about supporting people who want to do something. I'm not about supporting dreamers. Now, I did have a guy who wrote to me telling me that um, what he liked to do was dream up scenarios, suggest them to people, and let them do the work. And that's how he got his jollies. He considered himself a muse. I considered him a waste of time. It's no good dreaming about these things. I'm practical. I have a practical approach. If you have a practical problem, you've done some research, you want some help, I'm likely to help you. If you're a dreamer, and you want to suggest things that kept to you while you were sitting on the toilet. Or you want to ask questions where you haven't done any work, you're hoping I'll do the work for you, then it's not likely to wash. You might get an answer or two, but pretty quickly I'm going to stop answering you. So there should be a couple of corollaries that are pretty obvious from what I've been saying. And the first one is, there is no best way of doing something. I often get asked what's the best way of making graphene and I answer there is no best way. I usually get the response back, how can that be true? Well, you should be able to get from now that there is only the way that is appropriate to your problem definition. There is no best way per se. It doesn't mean anything to talk about the best way. So looking at graphene, if you want to make a graphene supercapacitor, there's a whole set of ways of doing it that are very good because the graphene has to have certain properties to make it good for supercapacitors. If you want to make a transparent conductive layer, the graphene needs a whole other set of properties and you need to produce it in a different way. 
If you wanted to be a filter for um, water purification, again, you would use a different way because it needs different properties. And these properties are inherent in this method of production. So there's no best way that will produce you a file of graphene that would be all singing, all dancing for all jobs. There's only a way that is appropriate to your problem definition. Your problem definition helps inform the solutions that you're going to look at, helps inform your research, helps inform your solution implementation. So get out of your head. This idea of the best way doesn't exist. Once you've defined your problem, it will help you target your research, which will help you implement your solution and the methodology is best for your um, problem, not best per se. And the other thing is that you're going to have the best results in something you already know something about. So if it's a field that you work in or it's a hobby that you have or an interest that you have, then you're already going to know an awful lot about what other people have been doing. And so it's going to be much easier for you to um, think about how to improve it and to think about what kind of problems actually exist. And the um, perhaps most important thing in that is that it's going to be something you're interested in already and that interest is going to sustain you through the downtimes. Because um, I have perhaps laboured this point a little bit but you have to expect a degree of failure and that failure is going to be very discouraging. And when you feel discouraged, an innate interest in the subject is going to see you through those downtimes and help you pick it back up again and forge ahead when you feel that it's going nowhere, because it frequently feels like it's going nowhere. Nothing happens instantaneously. You have periods when um, everything seems to go wrong. And then you suddenly have a period when lots of things go right. And then you have a long period where it all goes wrong again. And those downtimes can be very discouraging. So having an interest in the field already will help see you through those downtimes. Anyway, I do hope that this helped. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to watch.